So my group doesn't do AI per se. We use a lot of AI. Um, um, we, we use a lot of AI algorithms. And what we do is create databases, which I think are very helpful uh, for many different tasks, including AI. And so what I'll tell you about today is two types of databases that we've created uh, over the last years that I've been at Stanford. And I hope you'll see that, that one or the other is probably going to be very useful uh, for ads, uh, uh, for AI as it sort of moves forward. And so one way I think about information that we put in databases is sort of a, a continuum. So there's the primary data, and that's like sequences coming up from the sequence machine, somebody doing some biochemical reactions and looking at, at uh, the results from that. That data is, is put together, analyzed, cleaned up, uh, and made to in that information. Then after information, there's knowledge. Now, well, like a lot of times, um, you know, knowledge comes from people as they're looking at the information. And I think more and more we're thinking that, well, the knowledge can come from machine learning uh, and the AI sort of side. Then, you know, I think the sort of interesting part is, will AI help get to the wisdom part? Right. So again, wisdom is something we get, uh, but you know, can a machine actually help us in that? So anyway, that's just a, a thought for, for going forward. Sorry. Okay. So this was a picture I just took out of a magazine. It was a, a company saying that they bought a big genomics and information, you know, sort of database group, and, and they were going to use AI to create new tools. But to me. Um, this is really just information, right? You still need a human to put all this information together. This was their picture, not mine, and thanks. So I think it would be interesting for you to figure out how you would use artificial intelligence to make this much better. And this is just a fancy set of web pages, right? So but, but the machine learning and such could easily go beyond that. And so, um, to do a lot of these, these types of AI and learning, <clears throat> I think you need uh, you know, really um, uh, hardcore uh, uh, validated information to start with. And so just as an example of something that the Google DeepMind groups have done uh, a year ago, I guess it was, is that they started with the, the protein database. and. Um, so the protein database is uh, a database of molecular structures that have been created over roughly 50 years. And I don't know if, if you've looked at the DNA protein structures and stuff, but one structure often took a graduate student, you know, their whole uh, PhD thesis to, to create. It's a very intensive uh, laborious task of getting the, the protein to, to become a crystal and then studying that crystal to get the structure out of it. But uh, DeepMind uh, did this fairly really quickly, but they used this set of information as their sort of starting information. And so um, DeepMind created this tool called AlphaFold. And with AlphaFold, you can actually type in a, a sequence. This is a protein sequence, a fairly long, large one. And in about two minutes, it gives you back this structure here, which is very beautiful from a molecular biologist's point of view. And uh, they created this structure, not that it knew it before, because it figured out how various pieces of this language created this three-dimensional language and things. And so to get to that, they needed really, really validated, you know, extensive information. So I, my, my intention in saying that is that so our job is to create such a database and things. Um, and I guess it's, it's, it's an ongoing task for many things, but it's not just one database for, for studying health and such. It's really many, many databases that we're feeding into algorithms. Okay, oh, there it goes. Okay, so I'll start by uh, talking about a database called Sacramento Service. Yeah. I started this back in 1993 at Stanford when I joined the university. And Saccharomyces is yeast, it's budding yeast. It's the yeast that makes um, various kinds of uh, fermented beverages disappear. Uh, some people in Australia like this thing called Marmite, which is just yeast. Uh, it also, so it likes to make alcohol. 
uh, yeast also makes CO2, and so we get bread. Uh, and, and, and this is what yeast looks like under the microscope. It doesn't divide by fission, it makes a bud, and so that's why we call it budding yeast. And yeast is a eukaryote, which means that it's just like the cells in our body. It has a, uh, a cell membrane, a true nucleus, all the little components that, that our cells would have. And so that allows Saccharomyces to be a very powerful research tool. It's a model system. Um, there's been many, many labs over, well, almost 100 years, I guess, that have been working on the genetics and the genomics and biochemistry, talking about metabolism, making, uh, uh, understanding the pathways for not only biochemistry but for cellular processes. It's also been, it's also been used while, you know, yeast and humans diverged, you know, a billion, two billion years ago or something, right? You can still study human genes within yeast. There's been more than a thousand human genes that have been that are uh, rhizologous between human and yeast, and you can you can remove the, the gene from yeast, the, the yeast gene from yeast, and put the human gene into yeast, and it works, and you can study it. Okay. So so there's many different things, and then more recently with synthetic biology, so people are, are uh, inventing uh, methods to create small molecules and make products, perfume all kinds of things that I use and use, because um, it's, it's, you can engineer it well. So this is how knowledge used to be captured. You make a big library. But you can't necessarily find things easily there. You know, there'd be a small number of people that would have read many books. And so thinking about the, the term metadata, so what's the metadata for this information? Um, it's like the, the libraries have a code, the uh, Dewey Decimal System is what they use here. We have the title, the authors, the publisher, you know, there's really very little information. Maybe a couple categories that this is about something. But you don't know much metadata in detail for this. So moving to today, published articles. You still sort of have a problem that the metadata is the publisher, the author, the title, maybe some categories, keywords, and things. But of course, now we can, we can search these tools, uh, these, these texts, and get a lot more information that way. And you can actually add some information about the images. You know, you know that this is a yeast cell, you might know what's in that yeast cell and things. But the connections between them is not necessarily as robust um, as you might want. So we created this database, the Saccharomyces Genome Database, where we took, we had people, PhD trained, we call them bio curators, who went through and, and picked out parts of the paper. So remember, we started this before the World Wide Web existed, like five years before Wi-Fi existed, so long time ago. Um, and over the last 30 years, we've, um, we've annotated about 100,000 papers. What we do is we don't read the whole paper, so it's not as bad as you might think. Um, we look at the results. Because uh, not the conclusions, but the results. We don't want to know what the author, author said they did. We want to look and see what they did. So we want to look at the results. We want to look at the data, the sort of the description of, of that experimental process. And so, so we'll look at the graphs and the, and, and the, the southern blocks and, and such. Like that. And so many different types of data are shown here, and this is what we've been including uh, within our data. So I showed you that protein uh, molecule, the one that could spin, um, a little bit ago. This is just one page that we have in our database for that. It's uh, VSB13 is the gene name in use. And so this is just a summary. The curators would write this. There's lots of, lots of text that goes along with uh, publications that go along with it. But there's many different types of information uh, listed on the top, and that's a complete web page uh, of information there. And then there's lots of interconnections to things. So um, uh, I just wanted to mention this, that there, there is a starting point. And this has really been designed for people, right? It's a web page uh, for somebody looking at it and going through. And so it's not exactly the machine readable form that we, you know, we want to get to. Okay. But as we create annotations, so an annotation is the same, such as we 
we have a gene from PPSD13, and it's annotated to something called the Golgi apparatus. That's a subcomponent of the, of the cell, the eukaryotic cell. It's also uh, a lipid binding, you know, so there's other little terms it's been annotated to, associated with. But by looking at these things, you can also see that there's this gene here that's been annotated with Golgi apparatus. With, you, with these networks of annotations, you can make a query and sort of uh, keep dividing down and find similar genes that way. Uh, you have to use sequence, which is a normal way of finding similarities, but you can actually be using the, the annotations themselves. You can say, where is it? What does it do? And these things can coalesce really fast using the annotations. Um, uh, this is what we've done with yeast. So this is the type of information we've captured. Uh, it's gene information, protein information, the genomics, uh, what's in the chromosome. Um, uh, just, you know, then we're doing this for people, so we give pointers to the literature. One might say that we've summarized the literature for them. We've made tools that the community can find uh, uh, useful. So they, these are everything we put together. This is a different gene, but it's um, uh, uh, CDC6. But you, here I just show the, the many, many more pages of how this goes together. And we try to show these graphs with the annotations and, and the, uh, the, the networks of things so that people can get at that uh, and really explore this. You know, visually, you can explore a lot of information that way. Just touching back on the human gene. So because you can find orthology, the evolutionary uh, consistency between uh, the various species. So in this case, there is a human gene uh, FNX and FTL that's found to be homologous to the yeast gene. Okay. And this is the summary statement coming from that. But if you look at if you look at the um, these diagrams of the annotations, you'll see that so here is the yeast gene and it's orthologous to these two human genes, and this human gene is involved in this disease, and this one is associated with this disease. So this can tell the yeast researchers, oh, I can probably study some interesting aspects of this gene, even though, you know, uh, yeast don't get friendly attacks. We have yeast do have iron metabolism and things, but but this would be something that's very very different. That by dissecting the protein uh, that, that's made from the gene, looking at the variants and things, so yeast can be very powerful. And this is the kind of thing that we help the users find because of the uh, annotations that we treat. Back about 2000, there were three groups. My group with the yeast, the Drosophila, the Flybase group, and MAUS, the MAUS Genome Informatics Database. Um, we realized there was really no good way we could share information with existing uh, vocabularies. Everybody sort of had their own way of saying things. You know? So, um, and, and the researchers would publish things using whatever way that they thought was, was eloquent for describing something, which wasn't necessarily consistent with how the other person would describe that, that term, I mean that, that function. So what we did was create something called the gene ontology. Um, and just as a real quick example of what, what an ontology is, it's a, it's a controlled vocabulary, but it's got more structure to it. So a very clay example. So, an ontology is a list of words, right? But actually, each one of these terms has a name. It's the term name. There's also an ID that goes with that. But more importantly, there's a definition underneath. So it's a structured dictionary, you might say. But the structure is very, um, very dynamic and very powerful uh, from the computing point of view. So you can list these things together, and then you have relationships between the terms. So in this case, the heart is part of the circulatory system of the body, and then the muscle of the heart is part of the heart, which is part of the circulatory system. So you have relationships like this, because everything has to be true of one another. So each one has an ID, and a term, and a definition. When we curate to heart, we're talking about the same definition. Well, that one's easy. But there's there's many cases where, where you know, the, uh, you get into fine detail about these things. We've got about 42,000 terms within the code ontology now. Um, but the other aspect of that being these graphs, you could actually query for heart, and you say, I want every gene that's annotated there or anything below it. Okay, and the system, because this is all just you know a computer structure, 
we can return you know all genes that have done that really, really quickly. So, and it's all consistent because we're using the same ontologies. But you can also do this uh, between yeast and fly and worms and, and, and uh, uh, mouse and rat and everything else because we're all using uh, the same ontology genes. Okay. Here's just a, a, a quick graph of the genotology, and here are just more of these relationships. And this is so this is real genotology sort of stuff. But uh, uh, and so there's a query can happen in this. But. Okay, so I keep talking about annotations, and just as a, one more point about that is so we have the protein, and we're saying it's involved in, in sort of terms like this late in the zone, it's in the mitochondria. It does phospholipid binding, and it's involved in uh, the phospholipid transfer activity. We, we make this connection this way, but we do that because there's evidence for it. So we're saying we, we look at the results of papers. And so this paper is associated with the annotation, and we have an evidence code. This is actually another ontology that describes the, the way things are put together. So these are annotations, and each one stands sort of independently at some level. Okay, and there's lots of ontologies, and we use all of these for different aspects. So moving on from yeast, so yeast data is really nice. But say you want to look at Drosophila, one of the other model organisms as well. Um, you know, they're not, well, we have the same ontologies here, we have a different interface, right? We have, it's, they're all created by humans over a long period of time. And so we don't, we haven't set up our website exactly equally. But with the Alliance, we've been working about five years to do that. So we're harmonizing the data between the databases, and we're using one Alliance Central, we call it, one website to do that. Uh, and it involves these organisms, the ones around the outside. There really isn't a human database that covers the extent that, that these other models do, model organisms databases do. And so, uh, we're trying to set it up so that you can actually learn about human from learning about what the model systems have. Because, of course, a lot of the information that is used in uh, human uh, development has, has largely been explored in frog. Uh, Zebrafish is a vertebrate, so a lot of uh, studies have been done there. Of course, biochemistry comes from many of these, these uh, organisms as well. So here is that same genes page on the Alliance website. Uh, and you see we have lots of the similar path, uh, similar information. We don't have, unfortunately, all of the information because there's sort of a long tail of, of different types of information that each of the mods have. Partly it's because each model organism is used for different things and some of the databases have been incorporated. And if it's really unique to you, or, or only unique to a couple, you've done it probably in a slightly different way. So we're, we're working hard to harmonize everything in those two databases. But that's going to be a while before we can get there. So for now, at least, there's a, there's a reason to go back to the SCD database. Okay. The, the query setup that we envision for this is actually that you can go in. Here we come in with the yeast protein, but you can see all of the genes that are autologous uh, to the other organisms. And so um, thinking about it the reverse way, if you came in with human, you can see that, oh, there's information from mouse I can look at, information from rat, from xenobus, from zebrafish, and things like that. So this is sort of the way that you can navigate in, uh, and then actually very easily jump to the other, other organisms' uh, results that have been, been included in the database. So the so ethology is really the center to allow the multiple organisms to be explored. And, uh, oh, I'm going to right. So, so, so I'm switching. So that was a database. Um, our funding agency called that a knowledge base. Okay, this is the word they decided to use for these things. I'll now talk about a different project, which is the Encode project. So that the, the knowledge bases are much more, you know, really in the time talking about the human, uh, the researcher that's reading those. With Encode, it's much more about the data. And so. Um, ENCODE is a large consortium that existed for, for almost 20 years. Um, and it was really, so it's a consortium of many different labs. They, had, they did experiments, many different types of assays. And a unique aspect of this is that they weren't paid 
through the grants until they submitted the data to us. And that's unique in that um, you know, scientists usually just publish a paper and they submit it where they think is the right place. And they don't really consider too much about the metadata. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a DNA sequence, so okay, just put my name on it and organisms come from. But what was nice, so then we defined the metadata that would be used uh, and, and required. And then they had to successfully submit that, that information before they get credit for doing the experiment. And all of this is before they actually publish, before they explore it even more. Okay. So the project ENCODE is about uh, epigenomics. And epigenomics, so we all know that we have uh, you know, a set of chromosomes, and every cell in our body has the same chromosomes, which means, which means we have the same molecules of DNA. But we have hundreds of different cell types. So how does these different cell types get created? They go down different pathways for development. Um, different genes get turned on at times, turned off at times, things like that. So epigenetics is actually a modification of the DNA or the structure within proteins, uh, of the proteins that bind the DNA. Um, and so two examples of that is one, you can have uh, methylation. You can have methylation of the DNA itself, and this affects expression of, of that particular region. But um, more of the experiments were done looking at the histones. So this is chromatin. So it's a DNA bound up in protein called histones. And these histones can be modified. And there's oh, tens of different uh, modifications that have been included, uh, uh, bound for those. And those modifications are uh, allow an antibody to be made to the histone. And so you can very, very uh, selectively look to see which modification is on the chromosome at that particular spot. And it's using this te technique, technique called uh, chip seek. And with chip seek, you can, you, you, the result coming out of it, you see a region that's been protected because the antibody is covering the DNA and you can digest the rest of the way. So you come back with a peak that, of, of uh, uh, you, and I'll show you one a little bit, but there's, there's just a peak so you know where that protein uh, existed. Another just a way of looking at the, um, the types of assays that were used for the different problems. And so uh, CHIP-seq uh, for the, for the histone modifications. There's other things that we're looking at, the methylation for the genome. And then uh, lots and lots of experiments for the RNA-seq. And so RNA-seq is looking at what RNAs were produced within the genome. And so you can map that to see what, what gene has actually been impacted. You're just you're looking at what RNA was created. Okay. And then there's, there's even things, so the chromosomes uh, wrap around and touch each other, different components, so there's this three-dimensional architecture. And these assays allow you to actually explore that, that greater architecture. But as you might have guessed, we're all about metadata. The experiments need to be high quality, they need to be replicated, you need to know that this is a good experiment, right? That the replicates have to match. Um, but you also want to find the experiment. <coughs> and you can't find the experiment. Sorry. <coughs> you can't find the experiment if the metadata isn't good. Um, you know, if you want to do a search, you want to find everything that matches that. You don't want to have to guess what other terms were used and how somebody else might have expressed it. So, researchers were submit their data to us find the, the, the uh, structure of the data that they had to give us. We defined you know, the ontologies that they had to use in defining that. And so it was really elaborate, large metadata uh, objects that were created. And some of the things that were covered were listed here. So the data files actually have metadata. What is that file? What program created that file? Uh, many ontologies, as I've already mentioned. The software tools themselves. Um, I don't know how many of you guys do uh, bioinformatics day-to-day, uh, -day, but it's probably it's one of the worst things you can deal with, is trying to uh, uh, reproduce somebody's work, because they use the software, but it won't compile on your computer. Uh, you know, you can't find the software. It was done, uh, you know, uh, a while ago. The, the postdoc 
it's gone, you know, you know uh, you're stuck. You end up having to rewrite the software, and then you don't know if you're matching with their software, right? So what we've done is, uh, what we were uh, told to do, and we did, and enjoyed it, is that we rewrote software and put it in Docker, So and then we ran, we reran everything with the same software. So uh, it turned out to be kind of expensive, but um, every time there was a new version of the software, we actually reran everything, and we did this up in the cloud. Uh, so it's all available, so pretty good. And then there's just, uh, we put together pipelines as well, and that's the Docker, I guess. Way to go. Uh, and then each reagent had to have a metadata as well. Because if you use an, an antibody, um, and it's been, somebody said this is the antibody to this system, that doesn't mean what you buy from another company is the same antibody molecule. Uh, you really have to look at the lot number, as they say. And so there'll be a lot of descriptions that go on there. And then, of course, if you have an organ, you want to know where it's from, who is it from, what do you know about that person? Okay. Another way of looking at some of this, and this is just really pointing out <coughs> the fact that we use the uh, so to sort of link these things together. And these are these are really objects. Um, they're JSON objects uh, that are provided, and we use uh, JSON LD and JSON schema, you know, JSON components, and we link them all together. And so uh, in the database, it's easy to sort of follow that through uh, for us. But we actually, you don't query the database per se, we index this in a way you just basically request the JSON object, and it's in milliseconds. It's all uh, hyper-indexed with um, Elasticsearch. Okay. And while we're linking everything, we also have these relationships. So um, this experiment has a replica, which has uh, libraries, each replica does, and it is reused, so you can trace this all through. Uh, and, and the computer is, is aware of that and provides that as part of our stuff. Thanks. So the metadata here is not just three or four things, it's actually hundreds of possible things. Of course, not everything has all the fields because they're not, not all appropriate uh, for the particular type, type of experiment. And then the, the one thing I know I'm hitting is, is a lot, so everybody has different metadata, but I just want to reiterate that the pipelines themselves have metadata. So it's the version of the software and the options you can use from the software that we want to make sure are, are provided so that if you do want to run it yourself, you can get the software, download it uh, from, from our GitHub or, or, or wherever we, we store the Docker stuff. And then you know which options to use, which, which reference genomes to use and such. Okay. So this is the web page. And I, I know I'm talking about the computer piece of it, but it's easier to show some examples of things here. If you uh, were to just type in, so this is one of those modifications that have some happens on histones, but you see that that uh, you know that there's various types of, of documents and, and samples that have been available uh, pretty much instantly. So this is saying there was 40,000 experiments, 40,000 files that are associated with some experiment that did that. So we have a very, very large number of experiments. We have about uh, 1.5 petabytes of files that are available, available publicly. It's in the cloud, uh, Amazon. So it should be fast download uh, most places. Um, and there's been um, uh, many tens of experiments that have been done as well. And so uh, while this is the number of files, every experiment has many different files. Okay, uh, just an example of, of, so I went with one of those pages and clicked on publications, um, and this is just an idea that, uh, a simple example, so we have many different uh, categories in the faceted search, but for example, you can actually look here and see how this particular group used the, ex the experimental data coming on this particular histone modification, and sometimes this is really interesting to see the biological phenomenon associated with, in this case, this particular uh, uh, histone modification. Uh, and, and here, they're saying, it's, it's, uh, there's, they just saying there's 70 different results associated with just that histone modification. Okay, so back to the screen again. This is the starting screen homepage. Um, if you were to click here, functional genomics, you would open up a screen that has a lot of these different facets, and it's just 
Uh, you can see that we have many human data, but there's also a lot of mouse and there's a little bit of these other model organisms, the tissue types, you know, the assay methods and things. So while the human will click on the facets, you can use these facets, the facets terms in part of the URL as, as part of the API. And so you can set up these queries just on the machine and be uh, getting them back. And I think I've, I meant to say that you, this little button here means that it will give you the JSON object for that. So, of course, then when, you, when you're doing the URL yourself, it's like form equals JSON. It's just something you add to the URL. You don't see the page, you get the JSON. Okay. Here's a matrix, a way of looking at some of the data I was showing before. Um, lots of different cell lines that were used, tissues, primary cells, and vitro differentiated cells. Uh, showing only five with these ones. If you look at the cell lines, there's many hundreds of cell lines that have been used, many hundreds of uh, tissues, <coughs> components of, of the body that have been used, and so on. So there's, there's a lot more there than, than what you're saying, sorry. Okay, and then looking at one specific set, so just a second, that, that gives you the JSON object. Um, so this is a particular experiment. They all have these sort of set of numbers. They have a little bit of letters and numbers and letters. We call them license plates because they're a little bit easier to remember than just simply a number. But it's describing the, the, the experiment in just, just big details. But I want to move down to the very bottom. And so each file, so the provenance of each file is known and shown here. So. The green are file, I mean, so the yellow are files, and the blue is the software used to convert it to the next stage down the road. Just an example that that very uh, last bit. So this file has this irreproducibility uh, uh, measure. So you actually know between the replicates that a particular peak, peak is submitting. And it's been reformatted from the sort of the, the text version to the binary version, so a bed file, to a big bed file. Uh, and and this, this is the software that, that did that step. If you were to look at that on the genome browser, this is just a, a really thin genome browser that's incorporated in our page, so you can look at it easily. But any of these files, you can actually uh, upload to your genome browser, such as, you know, we use the, uh, the, the UC Santa Cruz um, uh, genome browser a lot. The files can be uh, quickly uploaded. Uh, there, there's actually a button to do that on the page. So this is looking at, at a large section of a particular chromosome, well, not much of a chromosome, a little bit. And, um, but if you zoom in, you know, you can see the, the peak that was, was covered in this area, coming from this particular chip seed experiment looking for a CTC app. And the IDR estimate has been calling, this is the peak here. And then you can see from this peak, so this is in that file. And then you can see this relative to other information that, that's just that's shown by the fall and where that peak corresponds to the uh, exon. Okay. So all the information from that site, there's a URL again. We have a GitHub so you can find the information about our experiment. And then we also have the REST API that's helpful about that. Um, these are just some, uh, how much time? Is that good? Ten. Okay. So this is actually showing uh, a lot of the detail about what's up there, but I wanted to show you down here that there are various phases of this ENCODE project, and a lot of human data started happening in, in phase three. These are five-year phases. Um, but in ENCODE four, a little bit less human, but a lot more of these primary cell and tissue uh, samples that we use. Here. So it's been changing a little bit from phase to phase. But the basic types of experiments that were being done is, is, is consistent, and we're really just extending what was, what was previously had been done. Similar so thing here, so while there's many different assay types, and the geneticists love to sort of create new names for their assay, they just do it in a slightly different way. But they're all getting at, so like, this whole set of assays is really at transcription. So these are likely all interesting, not just what would have been called, you know, a particular essay type. Uh, it's just a, you know, they've made it a new name because then that name can be associated with their paper. I mean, being a little bit uh, silly, but 
But um, so anyway, so this, there's, this would be the set of sort of minimal set of the categories that the experiments are exploring. And then here it's um, just to show that not everything we have are files that came from experiments. There's a lot of computing that was done, and then that computing has resulted in, in file results as well. One particular one is this, oops, is this um, chromatin state. So, so by looking at several of the histone marks and, and uh, there's regions of it where this open spaces or not, a group uh, has, uh, groups have uh, defined what they call chromosome states. And so there's data about that coming out of uh, uh, cell lines and such. And then there's a lot of things where they've used in, in mutation to sort of add in and this and results going forward as well. So there are, there are a, a, a variety of these computational results. Okay. And then one last thing about, about these is that there's been many types of been many other projects that have been involved. And because um, we did a really good job of, capture, of capturing all the ENCO data, the, the ontologies uh, use in the metadata part. So we were asked to include many other different data, uh, many more data coming from other projects. And so we've done that. And that, uh, back on the homepage, you saw little other little boxes, and that's where that came from. Those were other, other projects that have been appropriate. So one other thing about, so we've got the ENCODE uh, uh, portal. And we have lots of metadata, and that allows connections between the computational results, the experimental data, and, and the use of the pipelines. Those data we've submitted to the other sort of uh, national resources and things, but they can't really, uh, they don't really contain all the metadata. They don't have the, the systems to create the metadata. But nonetheless, that's where a lot of people got to find the data. And, and then our result from any of these, any of these uh, projects is really to sort of help the scientific community. They'll look at this kind of stuff, they'll look directly to our sites, and then finally everybody uh, wants to share their results by publishing new things. And so this is, this is hopefully what we're facilitating and a lot of people do. There's been many thousands of papers that have reported that they've used the ENCO data, ENCO port, ENCO data. Okay. So then the last couple of minutes, I want to tell you about the, uh, the next project after ENCODE. So after 20 years, ENCODE has come to a close. Um, that was a long life of that. And so they've, they've changed it and made it more modern and more complicated from my point of view. Um, and the next project has uh, not such an interesting name, but it's called the, uh, the Impact of Genomic Variation on Function. And it's also a consortium like ENCODE. And they, it just goes by uh, IGDF. And so this was just started a few years ago. And it's a simple URL of IGDF.org. It's, um, we're, we've just started releasing some of the data. So there's only been, you know, comparison what we have with ENCODE. We've only got, I think as of last week, it was 367 experiments that have been released. So it's, it's really just getting started. And that's normal for these consortium. They're, they're deciding what they want to do and the, the standards that they want to use within the experiment. A big thing that's new for this project is creating a catalog. And it, the catalog is of so anything we can find about the variations, uh, the, the, var the variants that have been created or the natural variation within the genome, um, as well as a lot of other uh, uh, types of information created as a knowledge graph. Um, and then we're just going to share this within the greater consortium, um, really make it available to anybody that wants to use it, but actually work with a lot of other um, projects uh, to make sure that we're not duplicating yourself. And some of those other projects are listed here, where uh, some work on non-coding, some work on coding. There's these projects that really are focused on building networks of regulation and control. And then there's catalogs. Uh, here about that much like Inco was doing with many different assay types, but this is really uh, focused on single cell data. So they're doing a lot of work there. And this is also single cell data. So the, the, the goal then, where Inco was sort of working in this area here, IGDF starts earlier and they're making, uh, they're actually making variants, not just the natural ones. 
And so it's using these massively parallel reporter uh, essays, you know, where they're making CRISPR changes on a thousand places in the cell at once uh, and be able to isolate that out, uh, create the sequence, and then process that. Uh, with the goal of actually going to the point of the phenotypes, so looking, looking at changes, but actually figuring out how it changes the networks and then actually what phenotypes are associated with that. So this is this long-term goal. Uh, you know, ENCODE is 20 years, I don't know how long this one would be, but it's certainly going to be longer than five because they're not going to look at to maybe here uh, within five years because of the, the way these consortiums work. Uh, consortiums, there's like 25 grams, but there might be 70, sorry, seven labs per gram. Uh, and so there's a lot of coordination, and I don't know if the, the, the way a consortium works is differently than just a lab, and it's not so much you're doing what you think is the best thing to do and your students know how to do. You're actually working within this set of seven just for your grant, but then you're working with this, within this set of 25 grants so that you can all be consistent and, and, and provide things that are really uh, enriching the greater field. And so it's, it's different for a lot of people. I mean, it's new for a lot of people. And so it takes a little time to, to get these things working out, working well. This is just, I know it's probably too small, but, but the idea that there were so many, you know, millions and billions of, of edges and nodes and things, this is what we've already loaded. So the, uh, this uh, URL should work. It's using a graph database, and I forgot it, Arango, I think is the name of it. Um, it's, it's an open product, but I think we could pay them to support things. But, so there's lots and lots of uh, different external sources of information that are being absorbed and connected. So I guess these edges and, and, and notes together. Okay. So you all love to play with the, the new AI tools. I'm sure most of you have had fun with Dolly. Um, I was just thinking, you know, I wanted to use it maybe as an introduction, but I thought what works better is a conclusion. So AI does marvelous things. I basically asked Dolly. Uh, show me, you know, knowledge coming from the interaction of broader array of scientific data, including chemical structures, network diagrams, and images of cells along with DNA proteins. That was my prompt, and I got this. Uh, I changed it ever so slightly. Uh, I mean, I had to change the prompt. But so I guess it's really all the information from different component high-quality databases, and maybe this is the knowledge or the wisdom that's coming out of that. Um, it's just for you guys to, to discover that, how to do it. Okay. So this is where I live. Uh, this is the center of campus, but I live about a mile on one side of it. Uh, this is what I look at every day in the summer. We don't have rain in the summer, so the grass turns brown. But also I want to acknowledge the great team that's uh, worked on these projects. Um, I've turned to Meredith. I'm still active for a year or so, but Ben Zark is taking over the IDBF work. Stops Engel has actually been running the East Group for many years. And then I didn't talk about one project that's only dealing with um, single cell data. And, and that's the only project not funded by NIH. And uh, Jason uh, runs that project there. But basically, everything else is funded by the NIH, specifically the National uh, Institute of Human Genome Research. And I thank you very much.